somebody came into where I was working, grabbed me by the shirt, actually put finger holes through my shirts. In my head. Hey everyone, and I am still sick though I'm coming out of it and it's the day when I do everything and I'm surrounded by people and very uncomfortable, so we'll talk. What do you think of me filming like this? I have a new holder in my car so I can move my hands. How does that look? I don't really love seeing the steering wheel here. All right, so this is like the big chunk of time between Friday and Monday, where, or, or Tuesday, I should say, because I release in my head on Tuesday, um, where I can talk about a topic a little bit more in depth. And I had a few ideas for topics that I maybe wanted to talk about, one of them being a gay male and how does that affect my mental health, one of them being stigma, which is actually something I want to do like a big video on. And when I do make that video, I'm going to want your help in sharing that video out. Um, so that's in the plans already, uh, very early preliminary plans, but that's something that I want to do, stigma and mental health. Uh, but I, what I settled on, because I think it's just going to be easiest for me to talk about, is PTSD and what that is. And, you know, I've mentioned it a little bit here before, but maybe getting into a deeper dive of what PTSD is, what it looks like, would be beneficial. Because I know a lot of people came to my channel wanting to know more information about trauma and PTSD and what that means. Uh, I know I've helped a lot of people in that regard. So let's talk about it. You know, PTSD is not just for people who've gone to war, not to minimize the PTSD that people who've gone through war or who've gone through traumatic things like car accidents and whatnot. That's all significant and that all matters. But in the case of somebody like myself and many others, um, we develop PTSD for different reasons, and we're going to talk about those. So PTSD and trauma can affect a variety of different people in a variety of different ways. And it's important that we understand it as a community, as a, you know, worldwide human community. Because when somebody has PTSD, they have an 80% chance of having another disorder at the same time, which is known as comorbidity. So it's, it's good if we could just learn about trauma and PTSD so we have an understanding of how to interact with somebody who has it. It does make changes in the brain that has been observed. We're going to get into that tomorrow. I have to finish up what I'm doing today, but let's keep talking about PTSD and trauma because you probably know somebody who's been through it. It's a new night. Hopefully the cars are not too loud. I will try to speak a little loudly so you can hear me well. I'm still sick if you can't tell. It's getting better. <laughs> so I mentioned we would talk about the different ways that trauma shows up and like the different disorders and stuff. And very briefly you have um, disorders in children look differently than in adults in that children may um, have outbursts or seem irritable. It may not be so obvious that it's like a PTSD kind of thing going on, but when we're an adult, um, <clears throat> we can have something called acute stress disorder, which is what happens when we have a very short period of symptoms, and then PTSD is a longer form of symptoms. However, I like to always note that when it comes to trauma, not everybody experiences trauma the same way. Some people have enough resilience factors um, that they can resist trauma and not go on to be disordered. Some people don't. Uh, it's nothing better or worse than uh, from one person to another, so just is what it is. Uh, however, if you'd like to learn about all of this, and hopefully I'll remember to put this at the end of the video as well, uh, you can check out my series on PTSD and trauma. I go into detail, it's very carefully mapped out. Uh, what trauma and PTSD are. So check that out. Uh, there'll be a little bubble with an eye in it. That's YouTube's thing. And it will stay there till the end of the video. So if you forget, at least remember that the eye is there. But I'm gonna keep walking, hopefully find a place that's a little less noisy and we'll continue this discussion. Okay, 
okay, this should be a little bit better of a place uh, if I don't get bothered while I'm here. So you have different manifestations of trauma. And as I mentioned, um, there are factors like resilience factors that determine whether somebody will go on to be traumatized. And it's very unfortunate that this is the case because what this leads to is people feeling like, well, I went through the same situation that you did and I got through it fine. So this is your fault that you can't deal with this. Um, and that's actually one of the symptoms of PTSD is feeling like it is your fault. Like you could have done something differently when very often that's not the case. You know, we fall into situations in life that sometimes we're not equipped to handle. And it feels like our life, our identity, our self, uh, those things are being threatened. And that shakes up our body <laughs> to the core and it cha makes changes in our brain, biological changes, which if you watch my series, I get into that a little deeper, but the main one is that it makes our amygdala hyperreactive and especially to triggers, which are things that are reminiscent of the trauma. So they could be things that were going on at the time that the tra trauma was going on. So it could be music that was playing. It could be um, a certain color that was in somebody's vision at the time. It could be a, a touch, maybe a piece of clothing that they were wearing. All kinds of different things could be triggers and they can be very specific or they can be kind of generalized and vague. But our amygdala is kind of like our security alarm for our body and letting us know whether we're safe or not. And what happens is when these triggers happen, we get uh, the alarm system goes off and our body starts getting ready for fight or flight or freeze and we freak out and everybody manifests a little bit differently. Some people might feel very intensely angry and like they need to defend themselves, they're gonna hurt somebody. Other people might feel intensely vulnerable and shy away and feel like they need to get the heck out of there. Other people, and this typically happened with me, might feel like they just don't know what to do and they're frozen and they like their whole body kind of freezes up and they might start dissociating and feel disconnected from their body and disconnected from the world. Um, it's a very confused, kind of like cloudy feeling. So everybody experiences a little bit differently. I'm gonna continue walking and I'm gonna get into a little bit about how I experienced PTSD, how I healed from PTSD, uh, and let's see how far di we can dig down into this because it is something that affected my life a lot and I know a lot of people who are affected by PTSD and a lot of people feel very ashamed about it, they feel embarrassed and you don't have to feel that way. You really don't have to feel that way. So many people go through this, so we'll talk about it. I've talked about my story with trauma a little bit here on some of the previous episodes of In My Head. It's kind of funny thinking of them like they're episodes, but they are. And um, just as a quick recap, I learned about trauma at the end of my most recent relationship, which was actually the end of 2015. And the couples therapist that we were seeing started mentioning the word trauma. I thought, what does trauma have to do with me? I haven't been to war. Like, I... No. <laughs> uh, but as she kept talking about it, it started making more and more sense. Here comes a car, of course. So it took me a little bit, but I accepted, okay, this is trauma that's going on. And we started to deal with it. She sent me out to another therapist for five sessions, um, and which was not enough. But that therapist got me going in enough of a direction that I could figure it out for myself. Uh, I'm a pretty smart cookie and I'm into this kind of stuff, so uh, I just figured it out. <clears throat> uh, and I was able to help myself through learning about what trauma is. I had bought some books, uh, which you can find in my little favorites. I'll put a little thing in that the corner up there somewhere. Uh, and doing the, the exercises in those books and learning was enough to get me on the path towards healing. Now, before I get into PTSD, because I did have PTSD, I want to talk about acute stress disorder for a second. So acute stress disorder could be something like what happens after we uh, have a car accident. You know, for me, I was robbed at gunpoint at my first job. 
which turned out to thankfully not even be a real gun. I wasn't aware of it at the time, so to me it might as well have been. But somebody came into where I was working, um, grabbed me by the shirt, actually put finger holes through my shirt, uh, asked, get, tried to get me to open the register. Eventually the register did get open, but uh, they put a water gun, it turned out to be against my head, wrapped in newspaper, so I didn't even know what it was. And so the w week or two or three following that, I had symptoms of what would be PTSD, but because it resolved within that month, that's considered acute stress disorder. Also something that I'd like to mention is when we're going through a difficult time, maybe we're just having a really hard time because of school exams are coming up and it's like really, really intense, more intense than it would be for somebody else, or we're going through a move or a marriage or a divorce or something like that. There are things called adjustment disorders and you can also see some PTSD symptoms going on there. Uh, they're, they're trauma symptoms. They're not PTSD symptoms, but everything kind of comes back to PTSD in one sense or another. It's just you're looking at the duration and how intense the symptoms are. Now, I had PTSD. I see another car is coming, so we'll talk about that at the next location. <laughs> Oh, this lighting's actually pretty good here. This might be another option for a place to come. So, alright. <coughs> I had to check to make sure there isn't, like, people around, because you know I have a little paranoia about that for whatever reason. Before I went out tonight, I looked up something, and it was something that was important to me healing from PTSD. It's something that one of the books that I had done, the PTSD workbook had recommended, and it was listing out my triggers and listing out like how much they triggered me, like what, what surrounded them, what was the emotional stuff like. <clears throat> and it was interesting to me because as I reviewed them now, I realized a lot of these are really, really vague, like not feeling heard. Um, not feeling safe, and I'm like, well, that's just PTSD. So I didn't really understand, I guess, what a trigger was. But I, I, I know, let's discuss the ones that are more worth discussing. So one of them that was vague, and I still don't know exactly where it came from, was whenever the sun would go down, I would get this feeling of being not safe. And it was a very mild feeling, so it was hard to even notice it. I was never, like, afraid of the dark or anything. So it, I was like, where did this come from? But it was a trigger, and I still to this day can't really figure out exactly why. The only thing that I might be able to think is that when I would, as a kid, wait for my father to come home, maybe that had something to do with it? I really don't know. But another one, uh, which is funny considering, you know, I've talked about it on this channel a few times, was police. and. For whatever reason, I, I get anxious around police, and I I can think of one incident in particular where that might be important, where it felt like a police officer. You know, I've talked about um, being out in the open and kind of being what felt like harassing to me from the police um, during a period in my life with one of my exes, but there was a specific moment that I can think of where he, uh, a specific police officer, had pulled me over and it, it was the way that he did it. I'm not going to get into details, it's not that important, but he, he kind of set me up to be in trouble and then he got very nasty at me after the fact and it just felt very violating and didn't feel fair, so that was... Uh, probably the PTSD moment that I kept flashing back to that uh, that was the reason why uh, I had issues with that. Alright, so that was one thing. Um, that's like more... I don't know, I guess that is a trigger. I, it is what it is. Uh, but there were more interesting ones in there. So for instance, I had something with 
uh, going, when somebody would come through a door, like my anxiety would raise, like when I would hear them turning the knob or I would hear them, maybe somebody get it outside of their car and approach a door, like the front door, that would really send my anxiety up. Uh, oh, by the way, the way I was measuring this was just like if you, it's a simple way to measure anxiety in general is if you go from zero to 10, 10 being like insane anxiety, I can't handle this, and zero being no anxiety, I would notice my anxiety throughout the day. And that, that's one of the things I did to notice these triggers is like I noticed, okay, when am I having big jumps upward in my anxiety? And it didn't have to like reach 10, it just had to be a giant jump all in this sh short span of time. So, um, coming through the door was one. People coming through the door, I was like, this is really weird. And I couldn't quite grasp why that was going on, but it took a while. I kept thinking about it and mulling it over. And I think what was going on there was probably in childhood when somebody was coming through the door, it wasn't a good thing. Uh, and this speaks to one of the symptoms of PTSD called hypervigilance, where you're always on alert, ready, scanning your environment for threats uh, which is very tiring by the way because it, it your system's always on your system's always ramped up uh, so I think my system was ramped up and when I would hear the noise outside of the door or somebody about to come through a door it like spiked my anxiety because it was a trigger and it was unfortunate because, you know, I lived with my ex at the time and my ex would come through the door, so I instantly had anxiety. And I didn't know what it was, like, I think I probably called it anxiety, but I think sometimes it also felt like excitement because it's exciting when somebody that you love comes home. So I didn't really understand it, um, but going through and labeling my triggers helped me to understand it. And. You know, I could also link the coming through the door to the fact that my attacker, when he held me at gunpoint, came through a door, you know? And same thing with, like, the police, how I had the harassing by the police in the parking lot, but I also had an issue where a police car pulled me over and it felt like harassment. So sometimes these triggers, they're not linked to one specific memory. They could be multiple memories, and they don't have to be related things. Uh, so it's interesting how sometimes they compound like that. Well, I didn't really think of any other triggers, but writing down my triggers helped a lot because it gave me an indication of something that I could work on. And as I described, a lot of them happened in relation with my ex because triggers just happen with whatever's around you, you know? So my ex was around me often, and so things, um, <clears throat> things got attributed to him. Most of the time, to be quite honest, I didn't attribute like the way I was feeling to him. I just knew something was wrong and uh, I guess he made me feel like it was something to do with him. Why are cars always following me everywhere I go? I have to move. All right, we're gonna have to just walk and talk. So um, I didn't necessarily feel like it was my partner's fault that any of this was happening. I just knew that I was feeling these anxious feelings. It was happening a lot when he was around, but I didn't think he was the cause of it necessarily. However, um, I, I did forget that there was one trigger that kept going off for me and that was feeling like I didn't want to be touched and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that not wanting to be touched in any way and I f attributed it, you know, first of all I want to say this was one of the things that my ex was complaining about, I'm sorry it's so dark, he, he was complaining a lot about not feeling affection from me, physical affection. And part of that was, you know, I thought, well, he cheated on me, so of course I don't want to be touched. Like, it only makes sense. And now is the car coming. Hold on. So I thought, of course, like, you know, it, that's what it is. But I realized probably some of that had to do with some of the physical abuse that I went through in childhood and physical bullying in school. You know, I've had a lot of times when my body was touched in ways that were not okay, that made me feel unsafe, um, that were harmful. So uh, PTSD can impact relationships in that way, in that we 
overreact to things, not really understanding why. And, you know, sometimes we'll blame our partner or our partner will blame us for our attitude when really it's the trauma that's the problem. With that said, I'm going to cap off the night and I will see you tomorrow as I stress out about the mental health breakdown. One more thing, just to be clear, because I know I leave things in and I don't like to edit out like silly things that I say, but I know that people aren't actually following me. I don't have a paranoia that I'm being like followed or watched or anything, but it's just funny how it's really hard for me to find a place to just stop and talk with you. <laughs> Hello, hello everybody. I'm still sick. It's colder out here than I expected. It's a little windy. Um, I just finished doing the mental health breakdown and I tried to rush it because there's a Pokemon event going on that ends tonight and I wanted to try to get some extra minutes in out here for Pokemon Go. But we'll see how it goes. I, um, I want to continue talking about PTSD, obviously. There was something important that I wanted to get to. So I'm going to keep moving and hopefully it won't be too windy wherever I wind up next and I'll talk about that. <laughs> So as I said, it's windy, so I'm going to have to try to make these short as I talk. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to make the point that when these trauma reactions, these PTSD reactions to triggers are going off, they are happening almost instantaneously. I mentioned the amygdala goes off, your alarm system goes off. It's almost instantly. It's designed that way on purpose so that you prepare to fight or you prepare to run from something. Um, it's your survival mechanism and it's meant to just go on without you thinking about it. Your prefrontal cortex, which is your thinking brain, is actually shut off during that time and you won't be able to reason why you're doing things. You won't be able to think about them. So that's why for me listing out my triggers was helpful because it gave me the opportunity when I was in a calm space and I wasn't being reactionary to think about things and to try to figure out what was going on. Super, super windy out tonight. <laughs> so I had my triggers written down and that was like a good first step for me. So. Just having them written down wasn't enough, you know? It was good to recognize that they were happening, but as I mentioned, they just kind of happen automatically. So I had to do something about that. I had to be able to manage them. So one of the things that kept coming up in the books that I was reading was about getting in touch with your body and learning what it feels like in your body when you're feeling things. And somewhere along the lines, I also came across DBT, which is Dialectical Behavior Therapy, which um, I've seen recommended for borderline personality disorder, which was also something that I've suffered from in my life. So it just made sense to go in that direction and work on DBT. So that was one of the things that I did to start helping myself manage what was going on. <laughs> I am very orangey yellow tonight, aren't I? Okay, so last night I never found another place to stop and talk because it seems like lately for whatever reason there's always people around or cars coming by or it's just very uncomfortable uh even some of the videos that i did that will be edited together with this video somebody was walking right past me as i was talking about things uh and it's just weird it's weird because these are kind of private conversations that i don't want everybody here all right so i'm going to continue on about ptsd but i just wanted to make a little quick rant which is that uh, I want everybody, uh, and I, it stinks because I'm in this little bubble of people who know psychology, and, like that's the world I live in, this mental health bubble, because I talk to a lot of you, um, I go into little groups and things, I'm always reading about this stuff, and I am 
lucky in that regard in that I'm around people who generally get things. However, even in this bubble of the psychology mental health world, there's a lot of people who misunderstand things and get things wrong, and that's frustrating. But then when I go out onto regular social media with the regular general public, sometimes I see things and I get very frustrated because we are not doing enough to educate the general public on what different terms in psychology mean. We uh, unfortunately are still seeing a lot of stuff circulating in the general public that is old information. Uh, people are going off of psychological concepts that are 50 years old, for example, that are no longer relevant, that we need to work to change people's attitudes and beliefs about what those terms mean. Uh, remember, research is being done every year. We learn new things, so we need to keep updated and keep on top of that as we talk about these things. And we need to educate other people as we talk and let them know, hey, there's a new way of talking about this now. We know something now that we didn't know before, and here's the research. Here's how we know this is true. So that's just something I wanted to rant about. I'm going to keep walking, and we're going to get back to PTSD and how I hope myself to heal from it before this car comes. <laughs> I was talking about how getting in touch with my body was a big part of healing my PTSD. And this is something that you'll find spoken about uh, uh, in dialectical behavior therapy. It's a part of uh, meditation in a way. It's uh, something you just kind of need to do when you have your amygdala overreacting the way that mine was, which is a brain function that gets a little out of whack when you have PTSD. So as I mentioned, you go into fight or flight or freeze and your body does a number of different things depending on the type of person you are and how your body typically reacts in these situations, but it's automatic. It just happens. That's my half-eaten uh, lollipop there. Uh, so you want to get those reactions under control. And when your amygdala is going off, your heart is pumping faster, your blood is racing, your lungs are going uh, faster, and you want to slow that down. So the first thing to do is to notice that it's happening at all, because when it's going on, you may not realize that you're having this reaction. So getting in touch with your body and constantly checking in throughout the day will help with that. It will also help with dissociation, which is something I can talk about, which was something that was happening for me major because of PTSD. Dissociation quickly is just kind of feeling that disconnect from your body. So getting back in touch with my body, recognizing when I was triggered and what was going on was a big key in helping heal from my PTSD and then learning to calm my body down was equally as important as getting in touch with it. So once I got in touch with it and realized like, okay, these are the things, these are my triggers, you know, I wrote them down, remember, I had to learn how to manage them and how to deal with them and how to calm them down. Now, the simplest way to calm down your uh, system when it's in this, this haywire state is to monitor your breathing. And if it's comfortable, slow your breathing down. Take deeper breaths, slow it down, and, you know, obviously try to remove your body from whatever is stimulating it to be that way in the first place. And if you can slow down your breathing, it will slow down your heart rate in turn, and your body will start to come back down towards rest. And some of that hyperreaction will quiet. And then you can go back to rational thinking because something that happens while your system is up in this alarm state is your prefrontal cortex shuts down and rational thinking is no longer a priority because your body is primed to get you out of a threatening situation. It is not worrying about thinking about what that situation means. Uh, so calming it down is important and it was very important for me being able to manage the symptoms and to heal.
It's not as windy out today. It's still very cold, which I dressed a little bit more appropriately, so hopefully I can stand here and talk a little longer without feeling like it's horrible and I need to keep moving. So I had worked on getting in tune with my body. Let's talk about the dissociation because that's a big part of it. So not everybody dissociates when they have PTSD. I was somebody who was dissociating for years and not knowing that's what it was. I thought that I had some kind of diet problem. I thought I had sleep apnea, some kind of sleep problems, um, chronic fatigue. Like I had no idea what the hell was going on. All I knew was that I was always tired, always exhausted, always feeling like I couldn't focus on things, always feeling like I couldn't um, hold steady on something. And it didn't feel like ADHD or anything to me because I wasn't like hyperactive. It wasn't that kind of a thing. It just felt like I, I couldn't hold on to things. Like my whole world felt very foggy and fuzzy and I had low motivation. I was like, what is this? So I always thought it was a diet thing for some reason. Like I, because I have a vegan diet, I guess, and I just thought maybe I'm just not getting the right nutrients. I don't know. So I finally came across the term dissociation when that therapist had mentioned to me that I ha might have something going on with trauma and it happened to be PTSD. I looked up what dissociation was because that term came up in one of the books that I read. I believe it was uh, Healing from Trauma. Uh, I read a lot of books. <laughs> so I believe in there she started talking about dissociation, the author. And dissociation is feeling detached from yourself, feeling not in touch with your body, and it can be a reaction to a traumatic event or, so or a trigger and a, a flashback, as we call them, or an emotional flashback. And so I was dissociating constantly because I found the world around me a little too stressful and the triggers would send me straight into dissociation. Actually, the private therapist that I saw for five sessions when um, I saw her, she had given me like a compliment at the end of one of our sessions and I dissociated like right then and there and she pointed it out to me. And that was when I knew, like, this is totally dissociation that's going on. Um, because it was so clear. It was so obvious. And it was so weird to be in that moment that I dissociated when somebody complimented me. Because I was like, wow, my mind is really messed up if a compliment is so threatening to me that I have to dissociate. <clears throat> but that's a story for another time, I guess. But dissociation takes you out of your body, it makes you feel disconnected, it makes you feel like maybe the world doesn't feel real, like you're in a dreamlike state. Some people dissociate more heavily and they could actually travel, like go for a walk down the street and then just like realize they're halfway down the street and not know why they're down the street. They may have no memory of that, that's dissociative fugue. Uh, dissociative, uh, dissociative amnesia is when you can't recall things. There's a car coming. Dissociative amnesia means like you, you have pieces of your memories that are kind of blanking out, um, which is, was the complaint that I had very often of the first couple's therapists that we were seeing was that I felt like I had no short-term memory. So um, she wasn't a good therapist. If you watched some of my previous videos, you'd know that, but that could have been a clue to her that there was something traumatic going on, but she didn't pick up on that. But anyway, to deal with some of the dissociation involved getting back in touch with my body, which was what the DBT and the meditation and kind of stuff was helping me with. Um, grounding techniques in particular will help with dissociation. So those are things like like stopping whatever train of thought is going on, looking around, like right now I can see white lights, I can see green grass, I can see the gray concrete, so I'm describing colors and I'm seeing things. I see some bristly shapes in some of the trees, I see some straight rectangular shapes in the white lines in the parking lot. So those are all visual cues. I can feel the cold wind on me, I can feel the kind of like soft rubbery feel around my phone, the casing around my phone, I can feel the tree next to me is kind of like rough, so those are feelings. You can smell things, I can smell the bark of the tree, I can kind of smell the, the weather if you will. You can taste, I can't really taste too much out here just because I still have a cold, but you can do that. 
just get in touch with those five senses. That is one way to ground yourself. Another thing that I found very helpful was to feel the inside of the bottom of my feet. Not physically, not touch them, but just get in touch with what does it feel like on the bottom of my feet because that would connect me to the rest of my body because for me when I dissociated very often I would stay up in my head and staying up in my head um, disconnected me from the rest of my body so feeling the bottom of my feet would remind me there's a whole other body down there and then I would kind of like walk myself through okay what do my legs feel like right now what do my knees feel like what am I what does my waist feel like what does my torso feel like what does my stomach feel like what do my arms feel like what do my shoulders feel like and even as I'm saying this to you now I'm getting in touch with all those places on my body and that kind of brings me back into my body and feeling it and and instead of feeling like I'm floating kind of woozy I'm back connected with my body and I'm back connected with where I am in the world. That is, that was a major thing for me in healing for PTSD, just doing that because when you're not connected to your body, it's very hard to think, it's very hard to be focused and work on anything. So for me, just dealing with the dissociative symptoms was a big deal in allowing me to deal with managing some of the triggers. So let me see if I can find another place to talk and we'll talk about the triggers and hopefully wrap this up and then we'll ask if you have any questions about this because this is a large topic. Everything I talk about on the channel is a large topic, right? But I try to give as much as I can in one episode and save these larger topics for over the weekend when I have more time to talk about them. So let's continue talking and then I'll see what you have to say. <laughs> Oh, this is so awkward. There's always a car driving by and I'm always in places that I shouldn't be in. There's a car right there in front of me. Let's see if they go away. Dissociative symptoms were a big deal for me, and once I got those under control, then I could work on the triggers that I had written down. So one of the things that had helped me, it's starting to rain so I gotta hurry up with this, is that uh, I needed to feel that sense of calm. So I mentioned getting in touch with my body and learning to slow down my breathing would restore that sense of calm after I had been triggered. However, um, part of healing from PTSD is what's known as exposure and this can be done in a number of different ways. This is one of the principles behind EMDR, um, exposure therapy of course, and so one thing that helped me was to do an activity that you'll see in DBT and you'll see in EMDR called having a safe space. And a safe space is simply a mental visual of a place that feels calm and relaxing to you. So what I did was they ask you to try to pick a real memory maybe for you if you can. So I had a memory of laying out in the sun and feeling like totally calm and relaxed and that felt like the right memory for me. And you know, close your eyes and kind of picture yourself there, but like really feel it, like use your five senses, feel what it felt like to be there and then feel that calm and you know if, if it helps visualize other things there with you if you have like a uh, pet an animal that makes you feel good imagine that your animals there with you if there's a person imagine that they're there with you maybe your calm is not out in the sun like mine maybe your calm is in a dark place maybe your calm um, is at the top of a ferris wheel or something it could be anything it's really personal to you but the key is to instill that feeling of calm and safety and to be able to recall that image in your mind whenever you need it and then from that safe place and this is uh, again a principle of um, emdr because i'm, I'm re actually reading the book about i'm a eye movement and the sensitive Eye movement desensitization and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. Um, there is a book by the creator of that therapy, EMDR, and so I'm reading it, and this is on my mind because I'm still in the middle of it. But the, there's an exercise where you shift your mind, and you don't want to do this if it's too overwhelming of a memory. So of course, always do this under the care of a professional if your trauma is still very fresh, if it's something you know that you can't revisit, uh, that was so that's something you want to approach very carefully. But if it's something that you know that you can approach, 
um, and handle it and not totally freak out, then bring up some aspect of the memory in your mind and once you feel your heart start racing and you feel everything come back up, switch back to the safe place. And what you're kind of doing is like rewiring your brain a little bit and changing the association between the traumatic memory and um, that feeling of fight or flight and trying to like jam in the feeling of calm into that memory and lower the sensitivity you have to situations that remind you of that memory. That's a very basic way of explaining it. Of course, you'll always want to be under the care of a professional uh, in cases that are extreme, but the, there are things that you can do at home and this is something that I did was I gradually slowly exposed myself within my mind to the things that were hard for me to deal with. Now, I additionally exposed myself physically to some of those things. Um, I had the opportunity to do that, so I went ahead and did that. There's a car. I don't know why, but this particular car is going very, 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 very slowly. So anyway, I, um, I exposed myself very gradually to those things. This is why I have paranoia around here. This car is like slowing down and basically stopping and there's no reason for them to do that except that I'm here. Anyway, uh, so who knows? Maybe they're calling the police. I don't know. <clears throat> there's my uh, police paranoia going off there, right? Anyway, so I gradually exposed myself and I gradually managed to get it to the point where I wasn't so freaked out about these traumatic memories. Now, there are still things that trigger me, but they don't trigger me to the same level that they used to. I used to go from like a two, three, four, all the way up to like a nine in some instances, and now maybe it'll bring me to a five. And I can manage a five, you know? So everybody's experience is going to be different. I don't want to make it sound like my experience of PTSD and my experience of healing from PTSD is going to work for you. You know, I've had some pretty traumatic things go on in my life and I have been re-traumatized from having similar experiences occur over and over and over again, which some would say is complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, I also believe that for my borderline personality disorder developed as a result of all of these traumas. See, that car went by much faster. <laughs> uh, so borderline personality disorder, I believe that the trauma um, may be mixed with some of my natural temperament and created a borderline personality disorder in me, which I do not, I no longer register for. I've taken um, a, me a measurement to uh, the PID-5 to check for that. I don't have any personality disorder, so <clears throat> I mean, I never knew that I had it diagnosed in the first place. Anyway, I'm just going off on a tangent here. My point being that I've had some traumatic experiences. I doesn't, it may not sound like I'm like freaking out right now because I'm not, because I managed it. I managed the PTSD. So if you are somebody who has PTSD, it is definitely manageable. It is definitely something you can get under control. Something else that helped me, because I'm just throwing everything in here, is that I went on online support groups and um, specifically I had gone to myptsd.com, so shout out to the MyPTSD people. Uh, that helped me. I kind of like lurked there and I think I asked a few questions on there. Uh, and other support groups for other things I've gone into, you know, it just helps to kind of get in there and know that you're not alone. And so I would say that I'm healed from PTSD. Do I still have triggers? Of course. I think everybody has emotional triggers, whether they are full-blown PTSD or not. No, I don't think everybody has full-blown PTSD, but everybody has things like, maybe we call them pet peeves, you know, oh, it really annoys me when somebody does something like this. And if it's activating that fight or flight response in you, that would be a traumatic response. If I'm understanding what traumatic responses are correctly. So I think we can all relate to what PTSD probably feels like. So you're not alone if you've gone through this. And I would like to say to cap this off, I would like to hear from you. What has your experience been like? But I'd also like to know, because I know I left a lot out here, and I know everybody has different experiences. What would you like to know about PTSD? What would you like to know about trauma? Talk with me, talk with the community, and we'll see what we can come up with. And as it is continuing to begin to rain, I am gonna head back to my safe place 
and I will talk with you next time guys. Thanks again for joining me here. Don't forget to subscribe. I gotta do the YouTube thing, right? Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the little bell if you want to get all the notifications for my videos and um, leave a comment below. Let me know what your thoughts are. Have you had PTSD? Do you know someone with PTSD? I know some people um, have difficulty with PTSD when it's a family member. So if you have that experience, let me know that as well. <laughs>